Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much tonight for your word. Thank you for the truth that it brings. God, thank you that we can sing songs that are straight from the same place. God, whether we're singing about the thousands of names that you have, we're singing about the cross and what it means to be brought to the foot of the cross. God, we are praying and we're hopeful tonight as we stand in your presence, all of us, that you would do what you want to do because this is your space. This is your time. God, would you continue to work and move in this ministry in the lives of these teenagers? Lord, we love you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll be seated. Welcome to Movement. If you would, go ahead and turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 3. Now, I know last week we were in Exodus chapter 4. I know if you're a part of, how many of y'all go to church here on Sundays consistently? We've been in Exodus for a long time in our church, if you've been here at all. Uh, Currently, we're not there. We're not going to be there when our pastor comes back, but we have been there. And so bear with me tonight, because I know you've heard a lot about Exodus um, in the past year and a half. But I do believe that God wants to continue to use this story of Moses. And um, we may even be in Exodus again next week, so stay tuned uh, for what we do in this series and how it closes out. Uh, But the title of the message is this, if you want to take notes. title is, When You Feel Unqualified. When you or when I or when we feel unqualified. Here's the passage. Let's go ahead and read it together. It's two verses, chapter 3, 11 and 12. But Moses asked God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God answered. He answered. I will certainly be with you, and this will be a sign to you that I am the one who sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. Let me pray over this again. God, would you use your word tonight? We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you guys been on vacation this summer already? Tell your neighbor where you went. Tell your neighbor really quick. Where did you go on vacation? That's great. That's great. I just got back from Destin, Florida. And so that's where I was last week. If you were here, I was not here. I was in Destin on the beautiful beach of Miramar. And I'm going to share a story with you about that vacation in just a little bit. So stay tuned because I believe it's really important tonight. But there was a different uh, story tonight that I wanted to start with and tell you about because I've been in a lot of moments in my life where I felt unqualified. Anybody ever had a moment where you felt unqualified for job, um, position, responsibility? Like your parents said something to you and you're like, huh, are you sure you want to give me keys to that car? Because I feel unqualified. Some of y'all feel like overqualified to drive, all right? That's the ones who've had four tickets and four accidents. Like me, when I was 18 years old. Before 18, I literally had four tickets and four accidents. Amen? All right. Um, But I want to tell you about a moment in my life where I literally felt the most inadequate or unqualified um, that I've ever felt. And that was about three years ago. So I have a little girl. Her name is Eden. Uh, we're going to show you a picture of what she looks like today if you haven't seen her in a while. Man, Eden Lily is growing up. She is just quite the toddler. Um, she always has that little sweet top knot going on. And uh, man, she's still in that moment, but it's really hard to keep that girl from moving. Um, she's She's amazing. I love her to death. But um, Eden hasn't always looked like that. In fact, Eden used to be a baby. And before she was a baby, she had to be born, right? So my wife, back in 2001, called me one Wednesday out of the blue. It's literally a Wednesday night. I've been on staff for about six months. If you know my journey, been here three years, was on staff for six months, preparing for one of my few first movements that I'd ever been to. We actually um, were still called Wednesday night. We didn't have a name yet, right? We were literally shopping. What is this thing going to be called? You used to call it Crossfire. We were kind of Wednesday night because we had taken a break from COVID, didn't know what to call it. People still call it Crossfire, whole thing. Then we changed to movement. And some people still say, hey, going to Crossfire. I'm like, nah, it's movement. All right, been here three years. Cool. But anyways, we were in the place of like, what are we going to name this thing? And um, all that's going on, change is happening. Get a phone call at about, true story, four in the afternoon. And it is my beautiful wife. Her name is Erica. She says, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, well, it's four o'clock. 
Uh, she wasn't on staff at our church, okay? She was just kind of doing her thing at home, trying to figure out what she was going to do in Spartanburg. She's like, hey, I need to tell you something. Now, I don't, none of y'all, I don't think any of y'all are married, all right? Um, when you're married and your spouse tells you, I need to tell you something, it's usually not good. You're like, something's wrong. Like, I had to tell her something today, and it wasn't good. But I, don't know how to, I didn't know how to tell her to not panic when I had to text her and say, hey, call me as soon as you can. She literally replied back today and said, are you okay? Like, that's how we function as a married couple. But then she said, I have to tell you something. And I said, okay, what, we just moved here. Like, did something happen? What's, I never thought she was about to tell me that she was pregnant with our first child. Like, we weren't planning this. We did not want this to happen. And I mean, we did, but you know what I'm saying? Like, we weren't prepared. Obviously, you can tell that is my true, genuine, shocked, out-of-this-world face. I'm like, oh, Lord Jesus. I mean, I started praying, speaking in tongues. Y'all, I'm telling you. I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. But I was like, what, what am I going to Obviously, you can tell Erica is like in the middle of saying, actually, yeah, she FaceTimed me. That's right. And she's like, I'm like, why are you FaceTiming me? This is weird. Like, we don't do this anymore. Um, we're married. We don't FaceTime. And she did. And she told me, and we were in complete shock that we were having a child. And my shock literally came from the fact that I felt unqualified, y'all. I thought there's no way this clown can raise a child, right? But there's no turning back. So Eden came into the world, and I've slowly started to realize that I actually am more qualified than I think, or I've had to learn what it means to be qualified and along the way. We're in a series right now called Not Good Enough. You can see it on the screen. And this is part three, part four next week. We'll take a break on the 4th, we'll have a, a, a different, or the 7th, we'll have a different uh, message that night. Then on the 14th, we're going to go skating all together, and then we'll come back on the 21st, and that'll be our kickoff to the fall and our new fall series. So much information to come, so stay tuned on our ministry. But not good enough is a thought that I believe all Christians at some point struggle with. I believe that every Christ follower, believer, Jesus person is going to struggle with the thought that I'm not good enough to live up, not just to what my earthly people say, but what the heavenly father says to me and for me to do. So last week, Grace continued that, if you were here, and I want to extend it a little bit further because I believe there's another thought that can make its way into that thought of I'm not good enough, and it's a deeper feeling and thought that you've got to really think about and allow yourself to feel, I'm unqualified. I'm unqualified. That means not having what it takes to complete the task. So you could feel unqualified for a job, let's just say. My first job ever was Chick-fil-A. All right, praise the Lord. I, I'm one of those people, okay? I was Chick-fil-A through and through. I worked at Lowe's Foods. Y'all don't know that place, but that's a grocery store in Charlotte. Got fired two weeks into that job. Actually, I just quit, walked off the job. Don't do what I did. Obviously irresponsible, unqualified. Then I worked as a lifeguard, saved zero lives, but I did it, all right? I was there, fell asleep th twice on the stand. Anyways, clearly unqualified to work in my jobs. Maybe you felt unqualified for a position that you tried out for or you've worked for, or maybe it's a responsibility, like legitimately, you were told or given or asked to do something. Jillian Byers got on stage tonight and did the welcome. We didn't talk about this, the opening. She may or may not have felt unqualified to walk up on the stage, but many people do. I'm not saying Jillian did, but, but many of you may. If I ask you to do that, you might say, no, I, I can't do that, Seth. I'm not qualified to get on the mic. You don't want me talking, I promise. We have this in our culture, in our lives, unqualified. I'm not enough, inadequate. We feel it also spiritually. And I think we I believe we feel it more than we realize. So let me give you the key truth tonight. And then we'll jump into our two verses. Key truth. This truth I will get back to at the very end as I do often in the message. Stop living by what you see and start living by what you believe. Would you write that down? Would you take a picture of it? Would you remember that? Stop living by what I see, if you want to phrase it that way, and start 
living by what I believe. Because there's a difference in what you see and what you believe very often. And my goal tonight is that we can walk out of here, all of us, myself included, our staff, our adults, our students, you can walk out of here and say, I'm a little bit closer to living this out. I'll explain more about what I mean in a minute. So we're going to go back into this passage with Moses. Last week, like Grace talked about, Moses felt inadequate or unqualified for the job, right? Anybody, you can shout it out. Remember what Moses thought his problem was. Anybody know? Anybody? Couldn't speak. Thank you. Moses felt like he said to God, I can't speak. I can't talk. God said, I'll fix that. I'm sending your brother Aaron to go with you. He can do it. And he did. Now, that's the story she told you in chapter 4. Let's jump back in the story a little bit. Moses is in the same place, but it's before we get to that point. Because if you go read the story from chapter 3 and 4 of the burning bush, there is a lot that goes on there. But now, how did Moses end up where he was? Moses was born an Israelite, grew up an Egyptian. That's crazy. They hated each other, but he was both. Didn't know where he belonged ended up murdering somebody, went on the run, and now he's in the desert hiding. Y'all, listen, Moses had never been a shepherd in his life. He lived in a palace. And now he's a shepherd for some random dude whose daughter he married. So, tell me Moses isn't running from God. He is. And God says to him, in a bush that's on fire, I want to use you. I want you to free the people. Here's what he says. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So no one had encountered God this way. And this is Moses' first response. First time he talks to God. First time he encounters God. And it shows us everything in three little words. Here's what he says. Who am I? This question tells us everything about where the mind of Moses is. Who am I? Now you might be like, I don't, I don't talk like that, Seth. I don't know what, what he's saying. Like, what does that mean? Moses is telling us, telling God, I feel unqualified. I feel unworthy. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, who am I? Do you, do you know me, God? I'm no one. I don't have a relationship with you. I don't know if you remember that, but we haven't talked in a really long time. I'm not an option for you. But here's what I want us to see right here about Moses, about us, and honestly about many biblical characters. Here's the first point that I want you to get, except aside from the key truth. Here it is. Feeling unqualified is not uncommon. Feeling unqualified is not uncommon. Uncommon. Now, here's what we do as Christians, right? We typically open the Bible in our sinful, broken nature, and we go, come on, Moses. You're standing in front of a bush that's on fire, and it's not burning up. Come on, bro. And that's how you respond to God? You say, I'm nobody. I'm nothing. Who am I? Like, I feel like if God showed up like that to me, y'all ever had a moment where you're like, God, if you're real, would you please show yourself right now? I don't know if you have, but I have. Maybe I'm weird. I have a couple of times. God never, he never like appeared, okay? He never did that for me. But I imagine if God just poof, like set this bush outside the hangar when I'm walking home or to my car to go home, I don't walk home, on fire, I'm gonna be like, okay, God's real, I'm in. Like I'm done messing around. But Moses says, no, I, I don't know if you know, but I'm, I'm not really that good. I'm not really qualified. But the truth is, we can identify with Moses because, y'all, listen, we can totally relate, right? But we can totally relate to that position. Moses feeling like he was not the right person for what God wanted him to do. And, y'all, listen, we see this not just here in the story, but how often do we see it all over Scripture? How often, really, literally nine times out of ten, people in the Bible who God shows up and says, hey, I want you to do this, they say, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm not the right person. I, I've got too much sin. I, Paul, Saul, I was murdering Christians. Gideon, are you sure you got the right person? 
Abram, I, I, I don't know, God. Sarah, God, when are you going to give me a child? I don't believe you. I, I could go on and on of examples where God says, I want you to do something. And people said, I don't know if I'm qualified to do what you're calling me to do. It's common. It's all over Scripture. But here's what I want to challenge you with. Feeling unqualified is real. So what if we stop fighting the feeling? How many feelings, think about this, how many feelings that we have that I'm not saying are out of control and are messed up and are distorted by sin, but are real feelings that we've been given by God that we continue to fight? But what if we stop fighting the feeling? Here's one thing I learned as I preach more and more and more in my life and I continue to, to do this weekly. Like this hasn't always been what I've done, right? I used to work at a church before here and I would maybe teach, preach, communicate like once a semester. I worked on a big staff with a lot of youth people. But I have the opportunity now as a youth pastor to do it often. And every single time I get ready to get on a stage, you know what I feel, y'all? I feel unqualified. That's real. Like, I'm not over there going, man, I, I, I got this. Woo, let's go. Now, I'm fired up. I'm ready. I'm excited. But there are thoughts in my mind that, Seth, are you really good enough? Are you holy enough? Is there some sin that you need to deal with? Because it really feels like there is. Seth, what if you, like, you're really not a good talk. You talk really fast. Seth, what about what you're wearing? Those thoughts go through my mind, and I feel unqualified. Here's what I learned, y'all. Here's what I learned. Listen, don't judge what I'm wearing right now, okay? Here's what I learned. I learned to stop fighting the feeling. What do I mean? Why am I saying that? Because I wasted so much time fighting. Like, man, if I just, the next time I get up to do whatever God calls me to do, I'm not going to feel the feeling of being unqualified. So instead of fighting the feeling, I learned to leverage the feeling of being unqualified. Now, leverage is a big word. What does that mean? When you leverage something, you know what that means? It means to use it to your advantage. I said, I'm going to let the feeling take me to Jesus. Moses doesn't know this right now, but he's allowing the feeling to prepare him for what God wants to do. He's allowing God to work. How do I know that's true? Let me read you 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Just listen, it's a popular verse. You might have heard it. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your strength. No, I lied. I made that up. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. So a dude named Paul, who had everything rolling for him as a Christian follower, crushing it, we would say Mount Rushmore of Christians. Yeah, Paul's up there. He said, let me tell y'all something. I'm proud of my weakness. I'm proud of my unqualification. I'm proud of how terrible I am. Why? Because in my weakness, in my unqualification, in my I'm not good enough, God is good enough. God is strong enough. God can do it. God is made great when I am weak. We've talked about this already in this series, but I think this is so important. I think this is the vital part of the series. Listen to this. If we walk around as teenagers and you walk around with a mask on and a facade on that you're not struggling with this and you're not open and honest with it and you talk about it and you're real about it, you're never going to leverage it. You're never going to allow yourself to be like Paul who knew he was broken, Romans 7, who knew he messed up, who knew he had a sin addiction that he struggled with all the time, whatever it was, thorn in his flesh. And he said here, I'm okay with my weakness because I give it to God and God's power comes on me and I'm made strong. I love, watch this, when people express their feelings to God of inadequacy and unqualification in the Bible, God never said, hey, stop feeling that way, you idiot. 
Notice God's response is never, you shouldn't feel that way. You're dumb. You're an idiot. And those are strong words, yes, because that's how we project on ourselves. I talk to you guys. I hear it. But God says, okay, that's cool you feel that way. I don't agree, but let me show you what I can do. Verse 12. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So God responds to the unqualification of Moses. Hadn't even gotten to where we were last week in chapter four and he said, hey, I can't speak. But he's just saying, I don't know if you know me. Like, I I don't have a relationship with you. I'm not the guy. God says, yes, you are. Why? Because of a few things. I'll be with you. This will be a sign to you, talking about the bush that I have sent you. And let me give you a promise. He says, Moses, because of me, don't miss this in this passage, okay? This isn't God saying, oh, hey, Moses, you know what? This isn't God. Now, listen, God doesn't go, hey, Moses, you're really good. You're, you're just, you know what? I know you feel really bad about yourself, but hey, man, I made you and created you, and you're perfect. You are just, just do a good job, Moses. Now, God doesn't do that. God doesn't baby us. He loves us, and he shepherds us, and he leads us. He saves us, but he doesn't baby us. Some of y'all looking for God to baby you. Hey, hey, be a believer, be a mature believer, and know that your God is not going to just drag you along. God wants you to catch what he's doing, and he wants you to go forward in the promise that he's got you, that he sent you, and that he promised you. So here's what I'm saying. If you're chosen by God, then you're qualified by God. Hey, guess what? How many of y'all are Christians? Raise your hand. Yeah, raise your hand. Judgment, all right? You're raising your hand right now. You're a Christian. God has chosen you. God has chosen you. So you're qualified. Three things I want to show you you're qualified because of. Three things. I've said them multiple times. God is with you. What does he say to Moses? Let's break it down really quick. We'll be done. He says, I will be with you. Key words, with you. Underline that, circle that, highlight that. I will be with you. Hey, that phrase, if you search it in a, in a commentary, uh, in a concordance, that phrase, with you, is found all over Scripture. God is with you. And here's what it can mean when you read the definitions of it. For you, covenant with you, beside you, and God, but God. So here's what I'm taking I will be with you to mean. Listen to this, y'all. It's really cool. I take this to mean plus God. So you were qualified, number one, because everything you do as a believer, everything you do plus God, y'all, plus God, with God. It's you plus God equals everything. You do it with him. When he says, I'll be with you, it's, hey, take everything you're doing and add me into the equation because I'm there. Because I'm with you. What does he say next? He says, and this will be a sign that I have sent you. So he's with you and he sent you. I love this idea of being sent by God. Why? Because when you're sent by God, it's not just like a, hey, get out of my house, go live for me, I'm kicking you out of here. It's a, you're an extension of God. Y'all don't miss it. You're an extension of God. So when God says, I'm sending you out to do something, some of y'all, you feel like God has called you to do something. Maybe it's something with your life. Maybe it was something practical, like share your faith or talk to a person or end something or start something or ramp up your prayer life or get back into the word or make church a priority or deal with that sin. You said, God's called me to do something. And when God does that, he's not saying, well, just go and do it. He's sending you as an extension. Why? Because that's what that word means. When it says God sends you, it means he extends you out. Something that's extended, you know what's happening to it? It's still connected to the source. That's big, y'all. That was really good for me to hear. 
that God doesn't just send me out to the wolves without being connected to the source, to him, to the vine. You're qualified because you're an extension of God. Lastly, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. God has promised you. So God sent you, God is with you, or flip that order, God is with you, God sent you, and God has promised you. God made, here's what God is saying to Moses. He's making him a promise. He says, you will. Anytime God says, you will, he's not joking. He doesn't have to say, you know how we say in our culture, hey, I promise I'll do that. God doesn't have to say promise. Why? Because every single word he says is a promise. It is a fact. It will happen. He has to add nothing to it. It is just truth. And he says, so Moses, you don't believe me? You don't believe that I am the one who's with you and the one who's sending you? Well, guess what? You're going to come back to this mountain with those people that you're too scared to go and release, that I'm going to release, and you will worship me. Bet on it. Bet on it. So I want you to know that if God has said it, if he has declared it as truth in your life, truly, God, listen to me, y'all, it will happen. It will happen. If God has something to say about it. Now, what does your part look like? Because it's not just like, I'm just going to sit here and God told me he'd do great things, so God, go ahead. No, your part is to say yes, is to keep going, and when it gets sticky and hard, you trust the process and you wait. I know some people in this room right now are in a season of waiting, of trusting the call, the promise that God has given you, it will happen. And you don't know what it's gonna look like, but you may have to wait. I wanna encourage you not to give up. Stay faithful. Because God's promise remains the same, but man, we can really mess it up. We can really do things that push that thing and hurt our relationship. So now let's go back to the key truth. Here's what it says. Stop living by what you see and start living by what you believe. I think this is the key to conquering the mindset, to leveraging the mindset of I'm unqualified, of ultimately I'm not good enough. Stop living by what you see and start living by what you believe. You, you hopefully know tonight that if God has declared it. God has said it. He is with you. He has sent you, and he has promised you. That feeling unqualified is not uncommon. You're not alone. But I want you to walk, walk out of here tonight believing I need to stop living by what I see and start living by what I believe. Let me explain. I told you I just got back from Destin, Florida. And, uh, man, it's beautiful, beautiful beach, white sand, clear water. And on Wednesday, we got up to go, actually, I'm sorry, this was on Friday, our last day there. And, you know, last day at the beach is a really sad, hard day, y'all, it really is. And my wife woke up, and we were all kind of hanging out, chilling, relaxing, about 9.30, family was talking, we were there about 15 of us in the house. My wife comes upstairs and she's ready to roll, y'all. She's like, I got bags packed. I got my bathing suit on. Eden's got hers on. Let's go to the beach. And I'm like, all right, this woman wants to go on the beach. So we get everything together, just us three. Everybody's still hanging out, being lazy. And we take all of our stuff. I'm pulling two carts, y'all, like this, low key. I'm just walking down like this to the beach, like, hello. Um, and we get down there and all of a sudden people start passing us, like coming up off the beach. And I'm like, what? Is there a shark attack? Like, we saw two sharks, legit. I'm like, what's going? What's happening? They closed the beach, still yellow flag, not red. What's going on? I don't know. People started saying, hey, there's a storm out there. There's a storm coming. So we get out to the beach, and there's a guy who sets up umbrellas, and he's like, man, y'all see that out there? And this is what we saw. He says, y'all see that on the horizon? That is a terrible storm, and it's headed this way. I know it's headed this way because I've worked here for a long time, and storms that we see in the distance come right this way, so you might as well head on back. Now, when you look at that, and I, I posted one picture on my Instagram that had a bolt of lightning. I took a few that showed it. it. It was pretty legit. I mean, you could hear the thunder, see the lightning. You look at that, you pretty much have two options when you're on the beach, right? You can, number one, 
leave. You can be like, I'm out. Or you can set what you can down, as long as it's waterproof, cover it up, anchor it down, and then leave. But my wife was ready for the beach. She didn't want to leave. And said, so, okay, here we go. We're going to stay on this beach. In fact, let me pull out my phone and look at a little thing called the radar and see what's actually going to happen. And y'all pulled up the radar, and the radar showed this massive storm that everybody left for, that the guy on the beach who sets up umbrellas, who'd been there his whole life, said was coming our way, was actually going to go down the coast and not even touch us. Our rain percentage was 30%. And it said after an hour, there was going to be clear skies. So I said, well, the radar shows me what's going to happen, so that's what I'm going to trust. I hope you catch this. The radar is what's real. The radar is the expert. The radar is the evidence. The radar is the technology that was crafted to show me what this thing is going to do. And so we set our stuff down. We opened an umbrella. It rained for 10 minutes, and we were good to go. Why? Because I trusted the radar not the storm that I saw. So track with me, track with me. You need to start living by what you believe and not what you see. So often we get a call from God, we get a passion from God, a direction from God, and we see it and we go, that's too big. That's too crazy. I'm unqualified. I don't have enough in me. I'm not mature enough. I'm not experienced enough. I haven't learned enough. All I see is the storm. But y'all listen, if we trust the source, if we trust the master, if we trust the one who says, I see the radar, I see the bird's eye view, and I've sent you, I'm with you, and I've promised you, we can do it. You can do it. Here's my desire for you, teenagers. I don't want you to wait until you're 33 years old, 63 years old, to start feeling like you're qualified to do what God has called you to do. Do it now. The most important day of your life is the day that you have in front of you. You hear me, guys? Y'all hear me? The most important day that you have is today. We don't know what tomorrow holds. I'm not trying to scare you, but we don't know what tomorrow holds. You have today. God is saying, every single one of the teenagers in this room, I know you're young, just like Paul told Timothy, don't let people look down on you because you're young, but set an example. Some of y'all need to set examples for your household. Some of y'all need to set examples for your friends. Some of y'all need to set examples for the person sitting next to you, for the person you're dating, for the person you're following on social media who only gets on social media and sees whatever social media throws at them. And you could be the one person who says, here's Jesus. You're qualified. So would you live that way? Would, would you know tonight as I pray right now and you close your eyes and bow your heads would you know tonight that the God of the universe has qualified you because of who he is in you because of the weakness he turned and made a strength because of him because of his work because he extended you and he said I've promised you trust me live by what you believe I know there's some teenagers tonight who believe God is real who believe God will do what he says, who believe God is real, that we see in the Bible and will do what he did again in our lives today. So stop letting what you see dictate what you do. There's a lot of stuff to look at. There's a lot of trash. There's a lot of false things, a lot of lies, a lot of things in our culture, a lot of things in your head. Stop living by what you see, hear, believe that the world is offering, but live by what he says. So Jesus, right now, I thank you for this room. I thank you for these teenagers. I thank you, God, for how you're working and you're moving. And I pray right now for the heart that is heavy, that is saying, I need that kind of faith, Seth. I don't know how to do it. 
I don't know how to grasp it. I don't know how to believe it, but I want it. So right now, if that's you, I'm asking you to start praying, God, would you give me faith to trust what you say? There's an old song that says that, that I grew up listening to. God, give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good, that you got this, that you qualified me, that you've said it, and I know it's going to happen. pray that over your life today. And maybe right now you are wondering what does it mean to believe? If you have never put your faith, your hope, your trust, your everything in Jesus, can I beg you to not leave here tonight without doing that? Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. All we have is this moment. So God, we pray that you would save lives tonight, maybe. God, we pray that you would definitely wake us up tonight, fire us up to do what you've called us to do. Why? Why can we do it? We can do it because you are good. And you've been good for a long time. And you're going to keep being good. So as we sing about your goodness, God, we declare it. God, we worship you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.